Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. Last season, we discussed the early councils of the church, and now we're going to deal with a few issues that keep popping up age after age through reflection and examination of the scriptures. Starting with a topic I think is very important, how do we know which books belong in the Bible? I think it's important to ask ourselves this question because there are people out there right now spreading rumors that some books should be in the Bible which aren't. Remember, the books contained in Catholic Bibles are the five books making up what's called the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, followed by Joshua, Judges, Ruth, two books each of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, outlining much of the history of Israel, Ezra, Nehemiah, Tobit, Judith, Esther, Job, the books of Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Songs, Wisdom, Sirach, Lamentations, two books of Maccabees, a large number of prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Baruch, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Then, in the New Testament, we have the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Acts of the Apostles, also written by Luke, Paul's letters to the Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Titus, and Philemon, as well as two letters each to the Corinthians, Thessalonians, and Timothy, the books of Hebrews, James, and Jude, two letters from Peter and three from John, and then finally, the book of Revelation, also known as the Apocalypse of St. John. That makes a total of 73 books contained in the typical Catholic Bible, and if we want to know which books belong there, we need some consistent rule of thumb, which we can follow in determining which of these books are valid scripture and which aren't. This already presents problems because the Bible, the scriptures, are not like the complete works of William Shakespeare. They weren't all written by the same author, and therefore you can't use common authorship as a way of uniting them. Some are believed to have been written by Moses, others by St. Paul, others by King Solomon, by St. John, Luke, Matthew, King David, and so on. If we were to discover a secret book written by William Shakespeare and never published before this, then sure, it would rightfully belong in a volume called The Complete Works of William Shakespeare. However, there's no single author that we can appeal to to determine which books belong in the Bible. We could suggest that the Bible should contain all the available writings of certain authors, but which authors and why? Furthermore, what about cases where authorship of a book isn't entirely certain, like the book of Hebrews? Why would those books be included if authorship was the key factor? So it seems we can't use the author of specific books to determine whether they should be in the Bible or not, and the same is true of genre. The books of the Bible span a wide range of ancient literary genres, Letters, songs, proverbs, history books, stories, prophetic sayings, and apocalyptic writings are only some of the various genres contained in what we call the Bible. There seems to be no point that they all have in common on the basis of genre. Not all of them are books of history pertaining to God. The books of Psalms and Proverbs, for instance, don't even propose historical claims. The presence of these books in the Bible isn't determined by when they were written or the mere fact that they mention God or Jesus. The writings of the Roman historian Tacitus contain a reference to the crucifixion of Jesus by Pilate, but they don't belong in the Bible. We can't say that these particular books should be chosen because of their status as Jewish holy books at the time of the early church, because, for example, the writings of St. Paul were letters which weren't revered by the Jews, and the Gospel of Mark was written primarily to the Romans. However, I think we are getting slightly closer to a solution. Some have suggested that the books we currently have in our Bibles should be in the Bible because they were honored, read, and used by the Christians of the early church. However, other books, such as the Didache, were also honored, read, and used by the Christians of the early church, but don't belong in the Bible. Again, closer to a solution, but still not there yet. Some have suggested that the canons, groups of books, of scripture which early church Christians themselves chose to preserve were inspired by the Holy Spirit, and therefore those canons are the books that should be in the Bible. But again, there were multiple different canons, and they can't all be right. Some were indeed very similar to the canon of scripture as we have it today, but clearly, just being a canon chosen by early church Christians doesn't make a selection of books right, and therefore doesn't make it divinely inspired. In addition, there's another factor that all of these attempts at an explanation ignore. 
We as Christians believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, and therefore has the approval of God in all the claims it makes. Now, that's a big factor, because it means we need to do more than just show that our canon of scripture is reliable. We also need to explain how God gave it his approval. This is not too hard to do if you look at the kinds of things that were being said by Jesus and his apostles in those early days. It begins with the words of Jesus to his apostle Simon, while standing beside a massive stone at Caesarea Philippi. Simon had just confessed that Jesus was the Messiah and the Son of God. In response, And Jesus answering said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood have not revealed it to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 17 to 18. Now, some Protestants will say that Jesus was making a pun in the original Greek, that the rock he was referring to was the wrong kind of rock and didn't refer to Peter at all. That's false. Jesus didn't speak Greek, he spoke Aramaic, and the word he used was Cephas. We know this because of what St. Paul said after his conversion. For I delivered unto you first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, and after that by the eleven. 1 Corinthians fifteen three to 5 St. Paul makes repeated references to Cephas in his writings, an Aramaic word meaning rock. This is Peter. However, he also has some good advice to offer. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15 According to the Bible itself, the pillar and ground of the truth is not the Bible, it is the church. Specifically, the church built on Peter, which Jesus says, The gates of hell shall not prevail against. This is where we need to look if we want to find out which books belong in the Bible, and no, the first council of Nicaea in 325 AD didn't even touch on this topic. That's Da Vinci Code garbage. Some early church councils did address the issue of which book should be considered inspired and something to be read at Mass. For instance, a council held in Laodicea in 360 AD produced a list of books similar to the one used in the Catholic Church today, but it wasn't until a decree was issued by Pope Damasus at a council being held in Rome in 382 AD that anything like a definite canon of the Bible was established. All of the authority that the scriptures have come from the simple fact that God promised to guide his church to the truth in these matters. He made no such promise for those who separate themselves from that church. The Council of Trent is sometimes mentioned by Protestants with regard to the canon of scripture as well, because Trent was a response to the errors of Protestantism. However, what the documents of Trent actually say is that the books which have been used before should continue to be used. Now, here's the interesting part. If I were to try to argue from the Protestant position that the Holy Catholic Church has no real authority to decide which book should be in the Bible, what would be the logical conclusion of that argument? I wouldn't end up with a different set of books by rejecting the authority of the Church. I would end up with no books. If Jesus didn't give authority to the Catholic Church to determine which books were truly inspired, then no one has that authority. And if no one has the authority, then there isn't a Bible, because there is simply no other consistent way to decide which book should be in it. No person anywhere is so educated and informed that they can determine which books are divinely inspired better than the church founded by Jesus can. This is why when I hear people talk about hidden books of the Bible, I chuckle to myself. The books of the Bible were decided by the Catholic Church in the assurance that they would be protected from error by the Holy Spirit. Protestants, in rejecting this, face the very real danger of being deceived about which books the Bible contains or should contain, a danger the faithful Catholics don't face. To a Catholic, suggesting there could be other books of the Bible is like saying that the Church decided on different books than they decided on, published or popularized books no one has ever heard of, or that they knew God wanted them to include certain books, deliberately didn't, and then someone went up to heaven to get God's refutation later. The first two of those are self-refuting, and the third is quite absurd. 
For the most part, those who make claims about other books are likely to be either heretics seeking to undermine Christian moral teachings, or modern-day Gnostics who've taken a shine to ancient Gnostic writings like the Gospel of Thomas, which, yes, did exist in ancient times, but the Church judged their claims to be inconsistent with the authentic message of Jesus, as passed down by the Apostles. So, that was the end of it. Even if they had been consistent, like the Didache, that still doesn't mean they're somehow owed a spot in the Bible. Again, like the Didache. Gnostics wrote lots of writings back then trying to warp the Christian faith into something compatible with Gnostic beliefs, but Gnosticism has always been bad religion, and the writings of ancient Gnostics are no more accurate now than they were then. As a final note on this topic, there are, in fact, seven books that are missing from Protestant Bibles, which do belong there. Tobit, Judith, Baruch, Sirach, Wisdom, and 1st and 2nd Maccabees, as well as certain passages from Daniel and Esther. These passages are missing from Protestant Bibles because Martin Luther, the originator of Protestantism, chose to remove them, and for no other reason. Next, where did the name of Jesus come from? That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.